Uh, hi, and welcome to episode three of uh, Worry in the Garden. Our guest today is Jeff Aliff, a very interesting guy, as um, you'll discover as we, as we go through. Uh, welcome, Jeff. Really good to see you, man. Thanks, John. Yeah, it's been it's been a while. It's been too long. <laughs> yeah, it has been. Uh, maybe I'll make my way down to your part of the world sometime soon, and we can we can hook up sometime. That'd be cool. Um, um, get to see you. That would be great. Um, Jeff, okay, so I think um, what I'd like to do is just, you know, we can have a chat, but I'd like to just structure that we sort of go chronologically through how uh, how your um, your life sort of gone. And then um, as we discover, you know, issues of, of interest and stuff, we can do, talk about them more. Feel free to inter interject um, um, things you want to say at any stage. Sure. But I think it's nice just to have a little bit of a, of, of a structure. So um, you're a Marisweek boy like I am. Um, so yeah. you can maybe just start a little bit about, you know, um, um, where you went to school and, um, and and that kind of thing. Super, John. Yeah, I, I grew up, uh, as you correctly said, I was born and, and bred in Marisburg. Um, my junior school was, uh, was uh, I think I was in Scottsville for class one and class two, oh. uh, Scottsville yeah. Primary. And then I went to Merkiston, uh, became a murky mud rat. Um, <laughs> I, was at Merk I was at Merkiston until, um, until my high school years. And um, in fact, the one thing I do remember about Merkiston is uh, my PT teacher. I always loved sport. I always had a passion for sport. Yeah. And uh, yeah. my, my PT teacher was a gentleman by the name of Digby Rose. And um, yes. Digby liked to whip, take out the bat uh, every now and again when things got out of hand. And I, I remember him um, whacking us with a bat. But uh, he was very, very passionate. And uh, in fact, Digby was the guy who at some stage went to my father and said, you need to get uh, Jeff involved with gymnastics. And um, so my dad then took me to start gymnastics, but it turned out Digby uh, later on would have a son by the name of Jonty. And Jonty Rhodes would become oh. probably the most iconic South African cricketer and fielder. Um, so exactly. that's my link to, to, yeah, that's my link to Jonty Rhodes is that uh, Jonty was uh, Digby's son. And Digby was the person who told my dad to get me to start gymnastics, which in turn really laid the base for, what for for my the rest of my life i mean the discipline the, uh, mm -hmm. the sort of the, the the physical attributes that gymnastics taught you really became the, the base the foundation for everything that i did for the rest of my life so yeah uh, but i ended up matriculating my high school and i matriculated at st charles college uh, in peter yeah. and uh, i'm going to be honest i love junior school high school wasn't my thing i absolutely hated school uh, I, I matriculated barely barely Got through my trick, but I, I wasn't a big fan. I'd already got involved with skydiving from from the age of thirteen, from about standard seven, and uh, yeah. I just wanted to get out. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so um, that was so, it. So I mean, um, 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 gymnastics. Um, I think, as as you rightly say, it lays a, a, a later foundation. I mean, if you look at just at your body type, even now, it, it, it sort of it, it, um, it laid that foundation for 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 who you who you would be for the rest of your life. Um, I think yeah. I think that the whole idea about kids doing uh, karate or ballet or gymnastics, or whatever, is fantastic for that reason. Um, yeah, you, you know, and it's one um, of those sports. Actually, mm. Yeah, it's one of those sports that gives you not only the physical application, but it teaches you. There was a lot of pressure. I, I, gym, I did gymnastics competitively until about fifteen or sixteen years of old, uh, yeah. fifteen or sixteen yeah. years of age, um, and it gives you very much a, a solid mental approach as well because there's a lot of pressure in gymnastics competition and it teaches you yes. just to be to have a very positive approach so it was great all around yeah, yeah. okay so um I, I mean i know you've been passionate about um about everything under a canopy your whole life um and um yeah. the skydiving how did you actually get to start doing that i mean um what actually led you to to ppc John, I was I went to a, to the Royal Show in Peter Marisburg, uh, which you yes. probably will remember. It was an annual oh, yes. thing of, of huge excitement, and um, I must have been probably about seven years old. And I saw a, sh a show jump, a demo jump done at the Royal Show yeah. uh, under round parachutes in those days. But I remember yeah. seeing the smoke bombs on these guys' legs, and I remember seeing the smoke trail in freefall. And I, I yes. looked up and I said, "That was it. That was I was absolutely." <laughs> engrossed by the smoke and apparently yeah. i said to my parents then that was it that was my future and they bought me a, a book called sport parachuting by charlie shea simmons when i was for my seventh birthday i think and that was really wow. uh, 
that was where my interest, I was used to sail a lot with my father as well. Um, yeah. He was very passionate about sailing. But once I got involved, once I'd been seen this little bug of skydiving, these people in free fall, everything else just started going out the window. That, that became my compass, my direction, where I was going to, where I was going to go. So, and well, I started I mean, going to the parachute club early. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to say, I mean, you really did, did start early. I mean, you were, uh, what, um, um, your packing license at 14 and um, yep. 400 um, jumps before you left school. I mean, that is incredible. Yeah. I got special permission from, well, which was then the Aero Club of South Africa. My, yeah. You had to be 16 to start, but there was the courses yeah. in Peter Marinsburg those days. There was no accelerated free fall, so it was all static line. Yeah. <clears throat> and they only used to do one course every month, I think. And I'd yeah. waited, literally waited for about three years or four years to jump out of an mm. airplane. And I was beside myself. And the, the, the first, the closest course to my birthday was a week before I turned 16. So Eric Club <laughs> yeah. of South Africa said, right, we'll give you permission to start a week early. I was never going to wait for another three weeks. Uh, so that, I started a week yeah. early. And um, yeah, my first jump, uh, after that, there was a parachute club go away to escort. And I yeah. did, I think, six or seven jumps on my first weekend. Um, and that was it. Sure. I never looked back yeah, from there. No. No, for sure. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so, so then um, um, I, I know we, we we spoke a little bit, and you were saying that um, that you um, whilst at school you had some interaction with the guys from the bluff, uh, with the, the SF guys from the bluff. Um, yes. Was that just because of, because of, of, of jumping? It was. So what happened is we we um, were invited as a parachute club. Um, Chris Moorcroft, uh, who was, who's a legend in Special Forces. Chris Moorcroft was then running um, a Special Forces base at Dukuduku in Zululand. And, I, and uh, yeah. he invited the, the parachute club. There was always interaction between the, the recce guys and the, and the sport yeah. parachutists in Marisburg. But I, yeah. I hadn't seen much of it up to that stage. I know Phil Pass had, had an involvement with meetings and stuff. But we were invited to what, what Chris called the Hopper Valley Boogie. And we arrived okay. uh, in, in Dukuduku. And there was a, yeah. I think we jumped out of the, the uh, boss book for that weekend. And it was the first time that I had met the operators. And I remember uh, very clearly the first people I met was Franz van Dijk, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Oberholzer, who was one of the original, mm -hmm. one, was one of the early yeah. operators, Franz van Dijk as well. Uh, Chris Moorcroft was there. I don't remember too many of the others, but I remember Franz and Jimmy and, uh, and Chris. Yeah. And uh, I remember them being introduced uh, to these uh, civilian skydivers. And um, I remember very clearly everyone shaking hands. And I remember shaking hands with, with Franz. And he was, I remember him saying something about, what's all this handshaking bullshit? But he already hunskit. And yeah, we spent the weekend and I learned about, that was my first exposure. And I was interested. So I, I then found out who are the, who are the Rekis? Who are these guys? Mm -hmm. And I found out more about them. And, and that also planted a, planted a seed in, in my head. Um, so, yeah. And after that, yeah. like, subsequently, I then started seeing them regularly. I saw the next wave of operators regularly at the parachute club. They often yeah. used to, to have their base at the, at the gravel, at the pit. And they used yes. to have a super freelance or a puma, and they used to go and operate from the pit. And we used to operate from the club, and they used to come and join us yeah. for a couple of drinks in the clubhouse in the evenings. Um, and they were, a, they were a fairly wild crew. Um, and, uh, but, yeah, there was something about them that was very intriguing. Okay, Jeff, um, we seem to have a problem. So hold on a second. No worries. Jeff, hi. Sorry, um, we seem to have a hiccup there. I think um, um, the connection between Panama and South Africa might have been a little bit, bit dicey. I'm sorry. You, 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 no um, you were saying about you, you were saying about um, the operators being at um, at PPC at, at in, in Marisburg. Um, um, in, interestingly enough, um, I think that that there, there was that. Um, that casual interaction that sparked quite a lot of us to 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 have that aspirational idea about SF because we actually got to see some of the of the people as real people, um, you know, um, in a civilian environment, and, and it wasn't quite as intimidating in a way. Would you yes. agree? Yeah, I would. Um, and they became it was unusual because they became really good friends, and there was a lot of guys not only from from SF, but there was a lot of parachute battalion activity at the parachute yes. club as well. Obviously, a lot of the Members came and got involved with sport parachuting uh, on the civilian side through their through their time at parachute battalion, um, yeah. and, uh, well, and you know, as I said, vice versa as well. I mean, guys who who, who, um, um, who were involved in the club who then chose to go and um, and and try out for 
as you did for SF and, and, and as I did, and then um, other guys um, um, with, with, with one para, kind of um, as if they'd they'd connected the two in, in their minds. Um, I saw a lot of yes. a lot of guys do that kind of backwards and forwards. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so end of school, and and off you go to national service, and you volunteered. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about that, about actually doing basics at at at, 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 at um on you know at one recce on the bluff. Yeah, so it was interesting because um, so my very first mistake, and if I can look back in retrospect, uh, yes. is that I sh I should probably have gone if I wanted a, a, a career in special forces, I should have gone to either jails, to junior leaders in Otsua yes. first, or I should have gone to Parachute Battalion, um, yes. done done bat selection, spent some time in, the, in bats, and then gone on course. Yeah. But yeah. I also, the other, the flip side of the coin is that my whole driving force had been skydiving. I set myself yeah. an ambition to jump on the South African team. Uh, so yeah. I, I made a, a fairly quick decision to to volunteer for, for SF when I left. I was called up to one side in Bloemfontein. Um, the the uh, special force guys were there with the dog squad and parachute battalion were there i think on the yeah. second day the second or the third yeah. day uh, maybe even the se maybe even the first day i don't know but it was very <laughs> quick and up to yeah. then and all the all the volunteers for for uh, for recce you went and did your basics at parachute battalion and if Correct. you completed basics you then went and started the course cycle so Correct. we i volunteered for recce immediately off the ground they, we, they put us through a, a whole barrage of tests um, yes. at, uh, in Tempe at one yeah. side. And then they said, right, they, the group of us who, had, who passed that initial thing said, right, pack your bags. And we thought, okay, well, we're going to go a couple of kilometers up the road. We're going to go to one parish battalion. And they said, yeah. no, you're going to the station. They put us in a train and they said, you're going to, to the bluff in Durban. Oh. And we were very, really confused. And it turned out we were the first intake of to special forces school to do special forces school intake. Yeah. So, so so that that was in in, in eighty two. Um, 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 yeah. When when I volunteered, um, I got got there in, in eighty five. And so I don't know whether they liked the idea or not so much because we then got to do basics elsewhere and did not go to the bluff. So yeah. um, I, um, I, I, think, I think it was. John, I think it was a bit of an ex basic. Yeah, I think it was an experiment. Uh, the the yeah. feeling that I get, um, it was a it was an idea of Commandant to the, the, the then Commandant Kinghorn. Um, yeah. And I think he was very involved with it. But I think it was, we were pretty much an experiment because there was a lot of yes. aspects of our course cycle that were very irregular. Um, yeah. We got there and, and I remember it was uh, our, our leader base, our leader group at that stage was um, uh, was uh, Captain Hornby, was Major Powers. Uh, most of mm -hmm. our direct direct leadership was Major Powers. And we had Stan Hornby, former SAS, mm -hmm. uh, former C Squadron SAS. Um, yeah. And... Uh, so we were, uh, and we had, uh, we had, uh, Commandant Kinghorn was in charge of our leader group. And then, um, yeah. yeah, we did basics, uh, at the bluff and it was, it was fairly tough. Um, I mean, I'm not going to lie. It was fairly hard. Mm -hmm. The most difficult thing for me, uh, ironically was that all the operators that had become friends, people mm -hmm. like Sean Mullen, um, was one of the operators, uh, Franz mm -hmm. van Dijk, um, Jimmy Orwell, so, uh, mm. Woolly Ward, the late the yeah. late Woolly Ward, they were yeah. all they were they were there. And the very first day at, at one recce at the bluff, we were sitting in this big classroom type scenario. And I remember Jimmy Orb also walking up and down, looking at all the troops, at all of us. Mm. And he didn't. None of them had any idea. None of them had any mm. idea that I was going to volunteer. And I remember Jimmy yeah. Orb also walking past me, and he was Jimmy to me, and I was Jeff to him for the last yeah. three years. And I remember him yeah. walking past me and looking at me and just stopping. He was going up. The aisles from troop to troop to troop, looking and walking, yeah. looking and walking. And I remember him looking at me and just stopping. And he had this look on his face of compete, <laughs> like, "What are you doing here? Why exactly. are you here?" Yeah. You know. And yeah. uh, I sort of I strapped him in my chair, yeah. and he and off he went. And um, and it was like very strange for the first month. I used to pass these guys in the corridors, and it was mm. um, yeah, they very formal. The only mm. person, the only person who broke protocol. And sort of pulled me, pulled me around the corner, and said, "What are you doing here, Jeff?" Um, and we had a good laugh with Sean Mullen. Uh, oh, okay. It was okay. that, that, that was that was, and Sean and I to this day remain very good mates, very good friends. I mean, awesome. we speak a lot. Awesome. So yeah, that was that was basics. We finished basics. We then went to um, we started uh, platoon and foreign weapons, uh, mm. which was done a lot of a lot of that was done at Dukuduk. Duk. Um, yeah. We we then did individual phase. Um, 
uh, individual phase, if I recall, and in, involved a lot of uh, fibia fighting in built up areas, the urban mm-hmm. side. Yeah. Um, and also, a lot of time in Dukuduk. We then went to uh, Fort Dopis and we did bushcraft yeah. tracking and survival with Ray Godbier. Um, oh, awesome. That was fantastic. Yeah, that was great. And we were, weren't in the main camp at Dopis. We were just yeah. outside the main camp because there was another group doing um, minor tactics. Uh, the, okay. the intake ahead of us were busy with minor tactics at the time. Okay. And uh, right. so we were we were at a camp on the river bend, uh, which was outside of Dopis. And um, at Dopis, I uh, there was an incident where we were taken out. That that famous thing that that we now found they do with all the operators with all the courses. They put us mm. on the Bedford with no warning with our PT kit. Gave mm. us a couple of eggs. And we were driven and dropped two by two by two along the road and told we had to yeah. walk back to the to the other side of the white road. Um, we had the night to do it. We had to cook one egg and we had to bring, we could eat one egg and bring the other egg back in, in teams. <laughs> yeah. And we were then given a horrible, um, a horrible opok the next day in the river because somebody apparently had stolen, had hijacked a truck and stolen food, um, which never <laughs> happened. But, yeah. yeah, that yeah. that re that re injured it back. I did a show jump at uh, into Marisburg College, um, yeah, at the skydiving club in my matric year, and I, yeah. I injured my back. I had a I had a big collapse and I had a I had a lower back injury, and I felt that on on minor tactics mm. carrying an ammo case back on that uh, after that subsequent um, evening, um, yeah. I felt uh, my back go and it. it Never really recovered, um, mm. and then we went to selection after that, and I really struggled. But like yeah. I said, truth truth be told, I was off course. I was then went back on course with a July intake. Major Dostain said, "You want to go back on and give it another try um, yeah. uh, with a July intake," which I did, and uh, it wasn't going to happen. Uh, yeah. Truth be told, would I have qualified had I gone all the way to minor tactics? I don't think I would have, and I've said that to a few really? people purely because mm. I was I was too young. I didn't know why yes. I was there. I was half yeah. split. Half of me wanted to still pursue this skydiving goal mm. of becoming a South African skydiver. Uh, yeah. And I was just at a stage in my life where I wasn't ready for it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I have no excuses. It was a wonderful experience. No, no, no. no yeah. it's, it's, it's not about excuses. I find it fascinating. Because, I mean, um, as you know, I went through a very similar experience. And, and selection for me was uh, less about the physical and much more about the mental. Um, sure. And, I, cause I, and I, I wanted to ask you about that as well because – I'm I'm extrapolating from 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 what you say that um, that the, the physical itself, other than the injury, was yeah. um, a lot less of a problem than it might have been for some of the others because you had that foundation of gymnastics and generally being sporty. Would yeah. you agree? Also, I agree, hundred um, percent. Mm. Yeah, also that you're small and wiry and and strong, um, and you, you know all the first team rugby players fell out within the first three minutes because they were just too big, and um, mm. I, I think the same. Would you would you agree with that? I mean, just talk about that, maybe about the physicality of it. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. It's it's completely mental. It's completely mental, and even that. Mm. Um, but that translates itself to the physical, because even yes, though when I was sure. out there, when I was out there, and I was like, okay, um, I'm not, I'm, I'm now, I'm not feeling a hundred percent as I should. I know mm. something's not right. Um, I mean, obviously, my back problems to this day they persisted, and I've got yeah. to still look after. I've got to look after that injury, and to this day. Um, but like I said, that that wasn't. I don't believe that was the reason. I think the reason yeah. is is because that set aside a negative trend in my mind, where I was like really mm. starting to think physically. I'm now handicapped, um, mm. and it started to slow me down. And then I thought, is this going to affect my long term goals in skydiving? Am I going to be able to still jump? Uh, and yeah. it just and then it just snowballs from there. And and soon, yeah. as soon as you start to question, do I really want to be here? Um, that's it. Game over. Exactly. So it's it's exactly. almost entirely mental. It's almost entirely exactly. mental. Yeah, yeah. You've well, got to go I, there. You've I, got to go there with with an absolute one hundred percent commitment. This is what I'm going to be. I'm a special forces soldier. This yeah. is my focus. This is what I'm going to do. And I wasn't exactly. that person. Yeah. I had too many other interests. And yeah, uh, um, it's it's really interesting to 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 hear, to hear you talk about that. I experienced. Um, uh, I saw it myself in myself, and I saw it in other people as well. As soon as people had any idea of like, um, there's something else I could be doing. Then, then their motivation dropped, and, and then their physical stuff kicked in. And, and, and a day yeah. or two later, you could see them. You could literally see them going deflate, deflate, yeah. and they were gone. They were RTB. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so um, um, after selection, um, you weren't RTB because you didn't have a previous unit. So they mm. they did something interesting with with you guys. 
Yeah, we got super lucky, uh, John. And to this day, to this day, it's something that I really battle with. People ask me what happened for the rest of your national service. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's, it's. I think we've spoken about this privately. Yes. It's almost like yes. a lot of the time I'll just say, "Well, I was a chef, or I, I became a cook," <laughs> exactly. just because it's, it's. The story sounds almost too too bizarre. But there was a group Correct. of us that had that had all been had done uh, about six months or seven months of the course cycle. And we ended yeah. up via Five Sai, via going through Five Sai and then on to uh, a Gongo base, um, yeah. Sector One Zero, the headquarters of Sector yeah. One Zero. Um, and we had no idea. Five. Yeah, five, it was actually Five Two, uh, Five, five two, two Battalion. Okay. Yeah, Five Two. We and we were um, we were taken up there to a Gongo base, and the um, the the remember still remember arriving in the the BS Corp, the Five Two Battalion, BS Corp. And um, we had no idea what, what we were there for. And we were taken into the office of, office of the commandant of the base, uh, who was a very small man, very dynamic man by the name of Commandant Gary Jackson. Um, okay. And subsequently, I've heard a lot of people know about him. His nickname was Jockey, uh, Jockey Jackson. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he was OC. I think he was, uh, he was OC of 5-2. Of five, five and basically, yeah. he, sa- he sat us in a room. Um, and there was about t- about eight of us or nine of us. And he sat us in a room and he said, right, guys, I know about your background. And he said, I have got a proposal for you. I would like to start a team, a call sign. And he said, yeah. you will work only for me. You will report only to me. You will not be involved in the base in any way. You will work purely for me for the, for the remainder of your national service. Mm. And he said, we have got uh, two ex-SWAPO uh, members who are going to do a little bit of a, a know your enemy and train you. And he said, I would like to use you um, in, in a pseudo role to get taken. Are we going to work externally, predominantly externally? We might do some internal work, but predominantly externally uh, in a pseudo role. And he said, there are certain areas along the Kineni that he, he, as far as he's aware, there's lots of stuff happening, lots of crossover points. And he said, yeah. um, if, if you agree, we're going to start tomorrow. And he said, if you don't agree, he said, this conversation never happened. Um, I will send you back. I will send you back to RTU uh, or we'll mm. find out what your, what your next step is. And, of course, all of yeah. us were absolutely 200% in. And we were then taken yes. to the Oshikati Thruit Handel the next day. And we were mm. told to buy civilian clothes from Oshikati Thruit Handel. We could buy whatever we wanted. The idea was that we were going to look to blend in with locals and look like locals. And we ended up working with uh, two ex wapo guys who turned out to be amazing, amazing people. Uh, a guy called uh, Lucas Hennock and Vilio Cavella. And um, I've subsequently tried to track them down and I haven't, I haven't had any contact, but uh, they were great. And yeah, we spent um, the rest of the duration of our national service uh, working. Our call sign was Five Victor. And mm-hmm. uh, we literally were, were, we used to get offloaded by Puma. We used to get flown by Puma and offloaded about 20 Ks or 15 Ks from our, from our area. We used to build a fire. We used to, we used to, cover ourselves with black is beautiful, prepare, and we then used to uh, used to walk in. And the choppers used to leave us, and that was it. And we, we could be in the bush any time from, from two weeks to four weeks or five weeks, depending on, on what we were doing. And we then get a call to get picked up. We'd taken out, right back in base. We had, had a meal. We used to clean our weapons, go to the bar, get very drunk at the bar, yeah. uh, clean our weapons the next day, get ready, um, debrief. And then had another briefing, and then off again. And we had a we had a couple of yeah. incidences where we had things to do in uh, Namibia as well, Southwest Africa. Mm. Um, if we were in areas where the other South African units were operating, they used to freeze the areas, which was a normal yeah. a normal, yeah. Uh, yeah. normal thing with with SF operations. And um, and yeah, we never had any major success, to be honest. But we had a fantastic mm. time. You know, we had an unbelievable mm. experience. We we mm. worked predominantly at night. In the day, we used mm. to hide just before first light. We used to crawl in, find some thicket, and we used to hide yeah. and sleep. Yeah. And we had a, a guard um, um, rotation r- roster yeah. system. Yeah, we had a rotation yeah. um, for a, for an OP. And then uh, once the sun started going down, we used to kit up and gear up and, and head off again. And basically, our objective right. was to use was to use the locals. We used to send in Vilio or Lucas to speak to them. Mm. And we used to tell the story was we were a, a, a 10-man group of SWAPO who had lost, oh. our, lost our <laughs> detachment and we were trying yes. to find them and we were trying to get direction back. And obviously, uh, we sent in uh, t- Lucas Orvillo who used to get 
questioned by the locals at times, but mm. they had all the right answers because they were ex whopper. For sure. And For um, sure. yeah, we um, had some issues. You know, uh, we ran into um, we ran into situations where we our, our security was blown and we had to get taken out. So no mm. real success, um, but it was an it was a wonderful experience. I'm sharing I'm sharing the the photo now. I'm sure you can see it. Um, I just love mm. the the Panama the Panama hat. Uh, I yeah. think that's 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 delightful. Um, so that was yeah, all, no, that but, was all stuff we bought from from the Ashikadi through Hunter just to blend in with <laughs> the locals, you know. And as excellent. we and we collected bits and pieces along the way, you know, we collected bits yeah. and pieces along the way. But uh, yeah, we we carried. Um, we, there was a, a few. We had AKs occasionally, but we generally carried our R4s. Um, yeah. We had we had um, two mags uh, in the team. Um, yeah. We had a, we had a bunch of M79s. We could either carry yeah. an M79 as a secondary weapon or a 12 gauge pump action shotgun. And I carried an M79, um, yeah. and we had uh, two RPG sevens. Snotnius uh, yeah. is a beautiful little weapon, and uh, mm. we had two two RPG sevens. Um, so yeah, it was the R4s, RPG sevens, the mags, uh, a, a bunch of Snotniuses, and a bunch of pump action 12 gauge shotguns, which were obviously yeah. good in close contact at night. With yeah. you don't really know yeah. what's happening. Yeah, I mean the, uh, yeah. The, the 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 original name for for, for those military use was um was the um the trench gun, the trench clearing gun. I mean that's literally yes. why shotgun came into military use. So fantastic. Yeah. Okay, no, I, I'm, I'm I'm Jeff. So um once again the next transition. So now the army draws to a close. You've done your two years. Um, you know you've celebrated the forty days. Um, the day comes and you get yeah. out of the army, and then how do you get from there to Capital Radio? Or 702, sorry, it says, or 702. Yeah, so what happened is that um, I was I was already involved uh, with competitive skydiving before I went to the Army. Oh, that's right. I was, that's I, right. I was jumping. I was already starting to do a lot. I was jumping on teams and a lot of teams. Um, and, in fact, another story, which I might quickly throw in because it was it's yes, quite, yes. quite funny and quite relevant. Um, I was, I'd been at the bluff for two weeks uh, in my basics. And I was, mm. we were doing getting ready for an inspection. And on Wednesdays, you have sport paradas, the sport parade. Yes. And um, I got a message from HQ saying I had to be outside HQ at uh, 0600 hours the next morning. Um, yeah. And I had no idea why. Uh, in my PT kit. And, of course, yeah. my entire platoon were like – and and our section leaders were, okay, something – clearly you, you're in shit, yeah, you've done yeah. something. What have you done wrong? And uh, – <laughs> Exactly. So sport parade arrives Wednesday morning. I'm I'm waiting there at, at uh, 600 hours, and out comes uh, Franz van Dijk and Jimmy Orbalser. They don't say a word to me. They walk me to the Land Rover, to the Gary, put me in the back. We leave the base and off we go. And we drove to Louis Bouter Airport, uh, which is uh, which was then the international mm. airport. Yeah. We drive right to the far end of the airfield. I climb out, and there are all the operators, um, a whole bunch of skydiving gear, military skydiving backpacks. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. piggyback systems, and there's a super freelon. And Franz van Dijk comes up and he says to me, "Right, um, troop," he said, uh, <laughs> "You are you are going to be spending your sport parade today skydiving with us out of the super freelons." And I literally Fantastic. spent the whole morning. Fantastic. We went up fourteen thousand feet. I would they would give me a rig. We'd go up. We'd exit fourteen thousand feet with with myself and all the operators. Literally mm. just build a big round and fly the round. Yeah. Track off yeah. open. Land the freelon would would pick us up, fly us back. We had to land right in the far corner. The freelon would literally come and fetch us, lower the ramp, fetch us, fly us back, and the, the next rig would be given to me, and I'd put the rig on, and off we go again. And oh, wow. I was then taken. It was unbelievable, and uh, mm. I was then taken back to to my platoon, and I walked into the platoon that night, and of course the the all the troops were like, "Yeah, oh, Ayla, what happened? What happened, dude? You're in trouble." And I said, "No, well, I said I've just spent the day skydiving with all the operators." Out of a super free <laughs> from 14,000 feet. And of course, they were like, yeah. bullshit, whatever. Yeah, nah, bullshit, dream on, yeah. dream on. Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. so yeah. But anyway, so yeah, just to go yeah. back to your original thing. So I left I left the army and uh, uh, I started skydiving uh, competitively. I did a lot of canopy mm. RW, CRW yeah. work, and a lot of team RW work. And I was then yeah. given, we were at the Nationals in Bloemfontein. And one of the yeah. the Gunston the Gunston team were, were, were the, yeah. the hot the top skydiving team at that stage. Yeah. And one of the team Gunston members broke their leg just before the World Cup in France, um, wow. which which the Springbok team were going to, which was the Gunston team. And out yeah. of the blue, I got approached by Peter Lawson, and he said to me, Jeff, um, it was there were 
five out of the 10 rounds or six out of the 10 rounds in the competition down and he broke his leg. And I was approached mm. by Lawson and Peter Lawson said, Jeff, we'd like to pull you in as a replacement. You're not on an eight-way, you're jumping four-way. Would you prepare to come and jump as a replacement on the eight-way team for Gunston and skydive wow. in the eight-way nationals? So I said, mm. what an opportunity. Um, sure. I then I then skydived with the Gunston eight-way team for the last four rounds. Um, and thank goodness uh, there was no... I, I kind of coped with the pressure fairly well, I believe, for at that stage because I was super nervous. And I kind of had a yeah. feeling that this was a break. And mm. um, that that competition ended. I got the eight-way goal with Gunston. And, yes. and then I heard that they were going to France. The four-way team was going to the World, World Cup in France. Yeah. And the four-way yeah. team had to take a reserve. And out of the blue, um, I got a message from Peter Lawson saying to me, Jeff, you. get your passport you in order. You are, you are the reserve for our four-way team. So I was Fantastic. off to, to France, to La Police, at, to the World Cup, where I, I jumped with the four-way team. Um, and they then, I, I got back, and then they said, right, the, the Gunston sponsorship ended, and they were looking for a permanent member for the four-way as a reserve, mm. and to be part mm. of, the, of the, and Bob Bonds was the new team. And there was myself mm. and one other jumper who were in, were in uh, running in for the slot. Yeah, yeah. And I had to go and do a weekend. He did a weekend skydiving with him in Pretoria. And I then yeah. had to go and do a weekend with them. And they were going to test us on the jumps and see. Um, yeah. And I remember we were packing. I did my, I think, five or six skydives with, with the team. Um, and the guy who jumped with them would then win the slot. And I remember mm. finishing the last jump. And I remember packing. And I looked up and Peter Lawson was looking at me packing and I just remember Peter just nodding it and just giving me a thumbs ah. up and I kind of knew at that <laughs> stage. So yeah, yes. that's it. I ended up on the team. I moved to Joburg um, and I ended up going to Brazil to the, to the Melbourne World Cup in Brazil with the team uh, in yeah. 85. And uh, that, that was really uh, where it started. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, it was uh, the, the, the kind of the skydiving thing happened from there. I ended up moving back. Uh, I didn't have a great a great time in Johannesburg, to be honest. Um, yeah. I had a I had a, a, a girlfriend who we got I got engaged to. Uh, we moved. She moved to Joburg with me, and she was unfortunately killed on our very first skydive together with the South oh, African team. No. Um, and it was oh, impossible. No. Yeah. So uh, it, it was, was it was um, one of those things. She she was jumping a rig she wasn't used to, and she couldn't get the, the pull out from the leg strap mount. She battled to get it out. And eventually she pulled the reserve, but it was altitude awareness thing. It had gone too long, and she impacted Oof. with the pilot chute just coming off her back. Jeez. So that uh, that kind of soured soured Joburg yeah. for me a little bit. And Bob Bonds, the team, I think the sponsorship ended, but I made the decision to go back to Natal, yeah. and uh, I was decided to get involved with the industry with parachute industries. Yeah, um, yeah. And Pisa. I got a job with with Pisa, and I ended up working for Pisa. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. So, um, I'm 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 curious about this. Um, 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 you know, I, I remember I remember around about that time because um, yeah, about eighty six, eighty seven odd with, with with the pintail that that came out. You were involved with, with yeah. that, weren't you, with the project? Well, Norman, I, mean, I, loved, I was involved. With... I loved jumping the pintail. I loved it. But everyone we started calling it. I think the Swiss team had a big problem with it, and they started calling it yeah. the spin tail. Yeah, there was problems with the. I think the packing was was very critical. Mm. Um, mm. I didn't do a lot of jumps on the pintail, um, so I was involved with R and D, uh, research and development yeah. at Pisa. But yeah. that the pintail, my involvement was was more uh, was there was a lot of military rounds and stuff. Doing a lot of, yes. we I had, was doing test jumps for some of the military rounds and some of the military squares um, okay. uh, in in Zululand. And then also mm. uh, new canopy or W canopies. I didn't have too much to do with the pintail. And okay. then Pisa started developing their own zero porosity uh, sport yes. parachutes, uh, which yes. is basically a, a copy of, well, not a copy, but it was based on uh, the stiletto, the performance design stiletto. Yes. And I was more involved with that. Um, ah, okay. Our team, okay. we, we were given those, we, we were given those canopies and I, we, I was skydiving those canopies a lot. So I didn't have too okay. much of a, of a role in the pintail. But um, it was a it was a design by Norman Goodwood. Norman was so far ahead of his time, you know, and yes, he still is sure. working in America in parachute in the parachute business. But it yeah. didn't have a great name in South Africa, unfortunately. Yeah, no. um, <laughs> opening, but then openings were, but were a little now, bit. But 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 also, I mean, I remember um, on the drop zone about how many guys used to trash pack. Um, yes. And if you trash pack a pintail, you are kind of ninety percent guaranteed you're gonna you're gonna have a have a melt anyway. So I, I honestly think it had to do with that. I loved I had a 
um, yeah. a 144 that, that I used to jump that I loved. That was amazing. Yeah. The performance at you, incredible. Feel like a fighter jet. Yeah. You might remember a, a canopy called a, a Blue Track. Yes, um, yes, I do. So the Blue was Track a was a French... Yeah, there was a French was a French canopy, and that was kind of the blue track equivalent of the pintail. It was a okay. very strong elliptical wing, which was way ahead of its time. And I jumped yeah. the blue track, and and okay. most people hated the blue track. The openings yeah. were 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 They're crazy, hard. but the landings <laughs> were so fast, and I just loved the swoops on the blue track. Yeah. I found the landings yeah. was like super impressive. So I mean, I jumped yeah. the blue track for a lot of time, and a lot of people hated the blue track. And I think the pintail sat in the same. Class as the blue track. It was, once it was yeah. open and flying, it was a dynamic, yes. dynamic. ultra dynamic canopy. But if yeah. you could just put up with the openings, um, exactly. Yeah, it was like a. Which way is it going to open this way? You know, today. <laughs> yeah. Thumbs uh, up. Um, you know. So, so um, why I'm sort of focusing on 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 this a bit is that is that I mean, your your focus it, it would seem you can tell me if I'm if I'm if I'm right or wrong on this. Um, move towards the canopy itself and the performance of the canopy and how the canopy flew. Um, yeah. is, is, and I, I don't know if we're preempting it, but I mean, is that kind of what led you in, into, into um, parasailing later? It is. Yeah. The, the, so we started uh, in, in our trip to France, uh, we were first exposed to French people running off mountains with skydiving parachutes. Okay. Um, and there was no paragliding in those days. The French oh. were running off for skydiving parachutes. And then a guy, yeah. an American skydiver called Jim Slayton, started going to mm. Europe and started running off with high-performance skydiving parachutes. And that, okay. I think, was really the birth of paragliding. And when we came back to Parachute Club in Marisburg, we started, mm. there was a small group of us who started experimenting and running off mountains with skydiving parachutes. And we figured that. out that eventually that we could soar and we could start soaring. And we used to go to Hella Hella, yeah. some of the hang gliding mm. sites, and we were flying for an hour at a time. Mm. And... Up to 1986, there was no such thing as paragliding. Suddenly, no. in 1986, a new sport arrived, and they called it parapente, <laughs> which was yes. all these guys with, with neon-colored clothes. And uh, and so paragliding was born, parapente. Yes. And um, we, of course, laughed because we, we told them we've been doing this for years. We've been running off mountains. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so it was a natural – and I was still Naturally. at Pisa at that stage. And uh, mm. shortly after that, I left Pisa and started a full-time AFF school. But my interest in, in swooping and small, fast parachutes just got bigger and bigger and bigger. So, yeah, the paragliding for me was a natural uh, evolution. Natural progression, um, yeah. Yeah. So um, the, the, AF, the, the AFF school, I mean, I, I did my AFF um, at PPC around about that, uh, well, maybe a year after that, I think. Yes. Um, and, and you had already moved, moved on by that time. I mean, so you weren't there for very long, a year or, a year or two? Yeah. Um, I was um, there. I think I then left and I went to the States. Um, yes. I, I went to the US and I spent, a, I spent a couple of years, well, a year and a half skydiving at Zephyr Hills in Florida. And I spent okay. some time at, at Paris Valley, teaching RW at Paris Valley. Um, and then came back and then I got involved with a little bit of competition stuff again. Um, and then uh, Andy, my AFA partner, Andy was then yes. offered a really nice job in Spain. Um, yes. And I, at that stage, decided that uh, I was I was going to kind of start focusing on um, on other things. Uh, I just started yeah, getting just... really. We'd been skydiving. I was skydiving on a team. We were doing like six or twelve jumps on the weekend, and then Monday to Monday to Saturday, Monday to Friday, we were, we were doing AFF while I was working yeah. in skydiving. And I just started yeah. to get really tired, and and I think uh, I kind of burnt out. For a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it, it gets um, hard on the hard on the body as well. I mean, um, Andy yeah. Andy Seal um was what um, um he was my 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 lead instructor on, on the AFF, and I remember him saying similar things that yeah. um um it gets to a point where you're responsible for other people who can be real idiots in the air, and that mm. gets wearing on you. That it takes the joy out of the skydiving. Yeah, I mean, we had some we had some horrific experiences, <clears throat> you mm. know, where you there's there's times where yeah, uh, people, but you learn to read people. That's the interesting thing. Sure. Is, is uh, you, you actually you learn to you learn to tell very quickly. Okay, this person is going to be a breeze on a course, or this yeah. person is going to be really really hard work. So yeah, um, but yeah. yeah. And I, interestingly, I, I, when I, I did when I did get into paragliding, uh, I never had an interest in instruction at all. I'd just been through that whole process in skydiving. I wasn't interested in competition. 
uh, because yeah. of my, all my skydiving competition and I had no interest yeah. in instructing people. All I wanted yeah. to do was to go That's and fine. fly the newest and the smallest paragliding wings available. I started hearing yeah. about these new kind of wings that were coming involved and and it's really yeah. for me it's it, it's uh, it's been a it's been a great time, you know, it's been Okay, yeah, so we'll we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll we'll come back to paragliding. I'm I'm curious um how you made the um the shift to 604. Oh, of course. Capital okay, eight. so the six of yeah, so the six of four shift was before I went to um, to Brazil. I was yeah. in Andy Searle's office. I was standing in the office yes. with Andy Searle, yeah. and the phone rang, um, and Andy said, "Don't you please? Don't you want to get that, Jeff?" So I picked it up, and it was a woman by the name of Janet White, um, yeah. and she said, "My name's Janet White. I'm a sports reporter on Capital Radio six o four, and we have heard that the South African team is going to Brazil." And yes. please, can I put her in touch with one of the members of that team? They would like somebody to maybe do a, a short phone call every night from Brazil uh, just yes. to talk about the competition. Yes. And I said, well, funny enough, That's me. <laughs> I, happen, I happen to be one of the members. And yes. it was just pure, pure coincidence. And uh, she yeah. said, that's amazing. So she said, would you be interested? And I said, sure. So, and I had no interest in radio at this point. So, yes. But I said, it would be great. I'm happy to do a, you know, and I remember still saying to my parents, hey, listen, you can catch up on our competition every day. You just got to listen to Capital Radio and I'll be talking to give a little update. Fantastic. So every night from Brazil, they phoned me. I would take the call and I would do like a 30 second piece that I'd carefully written down. And I had to do this, this whole ending. This is Jeff Aleph live for Capital Radio 604 in Brazil. <laughs> and um, when I got back to, to Durban, they were, Janet gave me a phone call and she said they were really happy. And she said, out of interest sake, would you like to pop down to the studio and just have a look if you're ever in Durban yeah. and we'll show you what it looks like. So I said, sure. And I went to Capital Radio, which is on the beach at that stage. Um, yes, I remember. Yeah. Uh, South Beach in Durban. Capital, they took me in, they showed me the studio. And um, I just started thinking, you know what? There's, there's got to be life after skydiving, after Pisa. Mm -hmm. uh, what am I going to do for a living? And I thought, this, this sports stuff on radio sounds like it could be something that I'd, um, I'd grab. And uh, I said to them, can I come and learn? And they said, sure. And they started teaching me. I, I'd start, I started spending every weekend there. They didn't pay me, but I just got more and more interested in about how this radio thing worked. And eventually I started yeah. doing little sections on their sports reports for them. And um, I learned the entire trade. Janet then resigned um, from Capital to move to Joburg. And guess who was offered a full-time job as a replacement? Fantastic. Um, that's so how I wrote. That's, so basically, you created your, you created your own internship um, just yes. by, by your yeah. enthusiasm, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that picture that you're showing on screen now was me mm. doing doing a, a, a sports report on on Dave McLeod was my boss, a fantastic sports presenter, and um, yeah. that was me doing a sports report on the Drive Show with I think Steve Bishop um, mm -hmm. and Dave McLeod guided me through everything and and eventually Dave McLeod became the breakfast show sports presenter and I became yeah. the afternoon drive show sports presenter and um, that background of being a capital radio it was only for four years but the training of the, at that station set me up to to pretty much walk into other stations around the country when I when I left capital. as a career I mean that that literally as a career. created your career for you it, it did exactly so, um, yeah. so uh, um, you, you know, what, what fascinates me about your story is um, um, it feels like an, 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 a collection of ad hoc sort of events, almost like there was a guiding hand that you couldn't see. That's like, okay, yeah. you need to have this background, you need to have this training and with this, and that kind of puts you in a place to take advantage of, of opportunities. I mean, um, do you have some kind of philosophy about that or... Um, that's interesting that you say that because it's the first time that I've thought about it and you, you're absolutely right. How did, how did Five Victor happen? Five Victor exactly. happened by a random situation where a commandant suddenly decided I need to get five guys on our year. And exactly. that, that started Five Victor and then the skydiving thing happened by a random phone call. Um, mm -hmm. the, the radio thing happened by a random phone call. The skydiving thing happened because a member of Gunston broke their leg and I was pulled in. Ultimately, I like to think that somewhere down the line, I was always aiming to jump with Peter. But you correct; yes, yes. it was it was almost fast forwarded by these uh, these random events. So, no, you're right. So, yeah. Sure. So, um, so off 
um, after capital, where, where? After capital, uh, we had uh, the the elections in 1994. Capital yeah. was a, a very politically driven station. It was actually yes. owned by the Transcar government. So I yes. saw the writing on the wall. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm I, I'm quite fortunate that I decided to make a, a, a gap to take the gap. A lot of other guys at Capital were still umming and awing. And um, yes. I, I decided to make the gap and I resigned from Capital. And I saw my future in radio, I saw in Cape Town. Um, yes. Because there was, there was some very strong radio stations in Cape Town. And the other yes. big attraction for me was that also in, at the age of 16, tying in with my skydiving career, I got involved with rock climbing um, through a very uh-huh. good skydiving friend of mine, a guy called Paul Leslie Smith. And Paul uh, Leslie yeah, Smith... Paul. Fantastic guy, yes. <laughs> yeah, and Paul got yeah. me rock climbing at, at a very early age, and, and that kind of went in tandem with my skydiving. I always enjoyed rock climbing, and the dream location for rock climbing is Cape Town. Um, oh, for sure. For many reasons. So Paul, Leslie Smith, um, used to got me going, and so when I then made the decision to leave Capital and move to Cape Town, it was two aspects of that decision. Number one, I was going to the very best radio stations, um, or the, the most choice for me, apart yes, from yes. Joburg, was, was quite hard, and I didn't want to go to Joburg. Um, yes. But Cape Town, for me, had the attraction of those mountains, so I thought, perfect. Yes. I'm going to go to Cape Town. I'm going to get involved with climbing. Um, I'm going to be able to fly paragliders in Cape Town because it's a yes. great paragliding spot, and I can still work for a radio station. So, yeah, yeah I, got a, I got a job quite quickly with Good Hope FM in Cape Town yes. and then worked for them for a number of years, then moved to KFM, um, and then st- stayed in Cape Town working for a number of stations. Um, the sister station, 702 in Joburg, so I did some work for 702. Did a bit of work for yeah. 5FM with Alex J from the Cape yeah. Town studios. So I, I, but very, I very much had a had a hand in a number of different stations in, in Cape so, Town, which was great. Um, um, sort of passively watching uh, some of your posts like on Facebook and, and, and that kind of stuff <laughs> over the years, um, I've been fascinated by the sheer number of like the most incredible sports people that you've gotten a chance to interview. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, Cape to Rio and um, two oceans and all kinds of stuff. Um, it looks it, from the outside, it looks like you are having an absolute jaw. Like, oh, this was great fun. Yeah. For me, the highlight of my radio was that aspect. People say to me, if you could consider the highlight, what would you say? And the thing for me, I always said, I'm not a great sports journalist. Because mm. I, my passion is is telling is meeting. I was is meeting great great sports people. I mean, I was honoured yeah. to have met. I met Ed and Senna. Um, yes. I met Nigel Mansell, Nelson Piquet. Um, I met David Beckham. Uh, all through sport, yes. and when I say met, I had I had one on one engagement time with these people where I was doing sitting down sure. with them, doing interviews with them. Kelly Slater, um, the iconic surfer, um, and that for me and. I always focus, like to focus on the very positive side of, of their their careers and the aspects that made yes. them unique as individuals. Um, all these negative sports stories that came up, I always used to yeah. walk away from them. I shied away from them. Yeah. But uh, it was certainly I got to meet some amazing people, not only sports people, just uh, celebrities. In when general. they're in the country, they come to the stadiums, they come to the stations, yeah. the radio stations. Musicians, you know, a man who was – our sound uh, in our military service, uh, Rodriguez, cold facts. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, Rodriguez spent, I spent a day looking after Rodriguez in Cape Town. Um, Fantastic. You know, and I mean, I met, there are the Brian Adamses, the Bon Jovis. So it was just mm-hmm. that the opportunity that we were privileged that we had contact with these people because they came through the radio station system. Um, Fantastic. So, yeah. I, I want to just share this photograph. Um, looking at, the, at, at, at this photograph, what this, illustrates for me is your passion and dedication um um you know i can't think of 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 another journalist of hand who would be able to pull something like this off you want to tell us the story about this photo yeah so what happened is is i became an ambassador of gopro back in the very beginning when the first gopro came out um, yeah. and the whole philosophy of the gopro act was an action cam and it was, yes. uh, it was used to, uh, and it was the idea was for surfers to put them on their surfboards, for mountain yeah. bikers to put them on their bikes. But I yeah. saw an alternative, uh, I saw an alternative use for a GoPro. And as the camera started to improve, the GoPro 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, mm. and onwards, 
I then, and at that stage, I was uh, I was very involved with the sport myself. I was trail running. Um, mm -hmm. I was fit. I, I was, and I suddenly saw a unique opportunity. And I loved being in the thick of the action. Like if it was a yacht, sure. I would like to go to the top of the mast and actually, if it was For a sure. climb, I would like to abseil with the climbers. So I started yes. marketing myself as somebody who would go and give the viewers. A, a very unique perspective of the sport. Yes. Not not yes. for the long range camera, but by actually running, mm. swimming, right up. Um, mm. abseiling with the sports people and being right yes. up there with them. So the and and uh, it, it proved successful, and I started getting a lot of work um, for producing images and footage for various live TV stations. Um, mm. The sailing, especially the Volvo Ocean Race, uh, I was doing interviews yes. with sailors up on the top of the of the masts. And it was footage that mm. um, the normal TV guys with these big cameras they either couldn't do. do or they weren't prepared to do. Um, yes. And, of course, I was very comfortable with my skydiving and my climbing. Um, mm. So it started working, and I was started to get being used for this kind of footage. And then the cycling, on the very technical sections, I would go and run with the guys yeah. because they were having to get onto brakes quickly. And by running mm. with them, it's not their point of view, but it was a point of view as if there was a camera following them, a drone following Fantastic. them, which it wasn't. It was me running yeah. with them. So yeah. it just worked. It worked. Yeah. And of no, course, as, as, as times evolve, there's now hundreds of people doing what I used to do <laughs> that are way younger and way fitter than me. So, um, yeah. But yeah. I mean, but you, you're a ground breaker um, in, in that thing. Um, so, something else that, that I followed with very great interest was your whole, and unfortunately, I don't have a photo of, of any of it, unfortunately, was your whole um, handstand 365. Could you talk, yeah. talk to that a little bit? I thought that was fantastic. I really loved that. Yeah, so that started off uh, a challenge for my son. Took a hand, pick a picture of me doing a handstand on the 1st mm -hmm. of January. And uh, and he just said to me, it was at a river um, in the garden. Yeah. And he said to me, hey, this is a cool photo. Why don't we do something like this every day this year? Why don't you just do a handstand every day? And uh, yeah. we were driving back. And I just thought about it. And I thought, hey, I've got a cool name. We can call it the Handstand 365 Project. Mm -hmm. And I uh, said, yeah, let's do it. So like an idiot, I put on Facebook the next that <laughs> night. I said, right, here's the first photo. I'm doing a handstand every day. Uh, it's yeah. called the Handstand 365. And I raced off enthusiastically the next day and did one. The third day, I was like, oh, what am I going to do? And then the fourth day, I was like, why did you even say you were going to do this? <laughs> and um, But I forced myself to continue. And it became yeah. not so much about me doing the handstand, but it, become more, it became more about me finding a really creative venue and then telling yeah. the story about a venue. And it actually 100%. started to challenge myself creatively. Yeah. And it physically, it kept me in, in great shape. And I really yeah. started to enjoy it. And it turned out, I mean, it, it really took off. Um, I ended up doing one on the roof of the Cape Town Stadium, on top of the Cape yes. Town Stadium, which, which yeah. is what got the ball rolling. Um, and, of course, the cable car, which was the, the coup de grace <laughs> on the roof of the yes. cable car. Um, it, was a great, it was a great thing. Um, I was happy to see the end of that year. I'm going to be honest. It was a lot of stress yeah. and a lot of work, but yeah, yeah, I loved it. Um, and to this so, day, John, people come up to me and they say, "You the handstand guy." I don't know my name, it. but they say, "Aren't you the handstand guy?" <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. so, 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 um, why? One of the reasons why I find it so interesting is that my passion has always been about stories, about telling stories. When I was publishing, it was uh, the story of the people is, is the story of the nation, and. Um, it seems to me that even though it's maybe not something that you um, um, would deliberately sort of sort of say, but it seems that your life has primarily been about telling stories. Um, mm. um, your own narrative very much subsumed in the 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 um, not quite as a journalist uh, as a, but as a storyteller. So the three six five for me is classic for that, obviously. But that's a culmination yeah. of what you've been doing at the radio station, the the sports the sports journalism. Um, all of those kind of things. So, yeah, w w would you say that's a fair assessment? You're, you know that you you could think of yourself as a storyteller more than anything. Yeah, it's it's. I've always um, I've always liked to believe that I'm. I wear my heart on my sleeve as well. For sure. Um, you know, I, I if I put stuff on Facebook, I don't only tell. I mean, if I've shared negative things that have happened to me on Facebook, sure. um, warts and all, as they say. You know. Yes. Um, and I I've always, I mean, social media. I've got a love-hate relationship with social media. Um, yeah. But I think a lot of people are in that situation. But I, I often go with the thing that if you're going to put you must if you're going to put something on social media, it must either be something that's either is going to amuse people, they're going to find it funny, mm -hmm. or it must be something that's going to interest them. Um, yes. 
it's going to be interesting. And those have always been, and exactly as you say, you know, I've had funny little situations that have happened to me that I've, I haven't thought about it at the time, but I've got home that night and I thought about what happened and I thought, you know what, there's mm. a lesson in that. You know, yes. there's a lesson in that. Like my a rough example is I did an interview with David Beckham and it was mm. absolutely, it was not going to happen. It was completely off limits. He was off limits. He, had, yeah. he was too busy. Um, so I accepted that. And then I, I made friends with a security. I, I picked up immediately his, his, who his security detail were because mm -hmm. people like you and I who are passionate about SF and about the, the military and about security, we look and we, we notice it. things. And I saw there, that guy sitting there and that guy sitting mm -hmm. there. Those are definitely, they're not mm -hmm. regular guys. And I walked mm -hmm. up and I approached them and I said, you guys are probably with, with Mr. Beckham. And they said, how, how did you know? And, and, and we then started talking and I built up a conversation with them. And out of that chat, uh, half an hour later, that I'd won their trust and, mm -hmm. and they found, heard about my passion with security and stuff. And they said, listen, by the way, I can make this interview happen. If you want to do it, I can make it happen. But wait for me to give you the nod before you approach yeah. David. And that's yeah. how it happened. And on the spur of the moment, um, I got the interview with David Beckham. And, and Fantastic. Ages after that, I just suddenly thought about that story. And all I did on my Facebook was I had an interview with David Beckham and I posted the interview. Mm -hmm. But years later, I posted the full story about what happened with, mm. with those security guys. And that mm. story had so much more traction than my interview. That's what people Absolutely. found interesting. I told the story and I, and I applied that to everyday life situations. About if mm. you just be, if you are humble and you're kind and you approach people the right way, you, mm. you can achieve things. You can achieve things. Jeff, this is a this is a, um, it exactly. This is one of the reasons that I actually wanted to speak to you about about what you've done is for exactly that attitude. And I think that that um, the whole idea about you know we go through all of us we go through seriously negative experiences. I mean, you've mentioned a couple of really bad ones, and and um, and yet the lesson that you take out of those is that you're not a victim. Uh, you learn lessons. You learn how to um, take those things and apply them to your life in ways that improve your own life and th those of, of, of th and those people around you. And um, um, I admire you for that, and I and I take my mm -hmm. hat off uh, to you for um, for exactly that reason. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so, so then, then just um, moving on to. Um, uh, you did some time in conservation. Um, I watched with great interest the, the the rhino thing and the cheetah thing and, and all the rest of it. Um, how did that that come about? Yeah, I did. I've always had a I've always had a passion for for conservation, but pr primarily my involvement has been marine conservation uh, yes. through radio. Again, I had the I had the access to. I did a lot of work with Two Oceans Aquarium, um, and I got mm -hmm. very involved from a practical point of view with filming. Uh, turtle and release of turtle and um, mm -hmm. release of, of cormorants in, in off Robben Island, off the boats where yeah. I used to dive. Um, and I remember being, while I was still at school, I wanted, my parents used to take me to a game reserve in a tell, Carcloof Game Reserve. Yes. And I used to yes. just spend, spend the day with the rangers, just wandering around, seeing if I could help yeah. out. And when COVID came around and all the sports industry was shut down, yes. my immediate thing was, um, I am going to see... Uh, if I can get involved with assisting with conservation. Mm -hmm. um, and um, my girlfriend, Christy, works, works for a group of editors in George. Mm -hmm. And they, thankfully, they arranged me a, a letter uh, during COVID, which, which made me a freelance journalist, which meant that I could, during lockdown, I was able to go out and to do stories. Ah, and if the, police stopped, okay. if the police stopped me, I had, a, I had official accreditation. You had a, yeah, and justification. With, and with that, I then went out and I approached a couple of game reserves, um, offered my services to help them, and one of mm -hmm. them came back to me. I went and did a video job of a buffalo relocation for them, and yes. they said, come and do it, come and shoot some stuff. Uh, we can't pay you, but just come and do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, the, my video was produced. I sent it to them, and next thing I had a phone call saying, right, come back. We want to start. We need you to start doing more stuff with us. Uh, and I, I then started working with them on a number of projects. They were involved yeah. with relocation, rewilding of cheetah. I went to yeah. Mozambique. Um, um, I did some some relocation of, of cats in Mozambique from Pinda and from the Northern Cape. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time in the Northern Cape working with, with the cheetah project, the rewilding, um, game capture work in the Northern Cape, uh, worked with rhino in the Addo area, in the greater Addo mm -hmm. uh, region. And it was all predominantly film work. But the nice thing for me is it wasn't film work. It wasn't all marketing. 
and the pretty stuff. Yes. It was, a lot of it was was the back end work for yes. the um, for, for the for the game capture companies. Yes. Um, so yeah, and I, and um, I'm still involved uh, doing little bits and pieces of freelance work. It's got a little bit quieter now. The the reserves yeah. that I was working for has been sold. Unfortunately, yeah. it's, it's now become a hunting reserve again, which is quite sad. Yeah. But um, yeah. I have got a, a couple of people, uh, friends who are involved um, in the in the anti poaching space, um, yes. and they there's some training potential for some training video work with them coming up in the future. So hopefully, I'm still going to keep my my finger involved with that. Yes. Uh, in a, in one no, way or another. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um. Jeff, um, I, I think it's been really great chatting to you. I just wanted to to, to invite you to say, um, you know, there's anything else that I, that I, we've missed out on that 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 um, you, you might want to just talk about or or add to. John, not really off the top of my head. I think that's pretty covered. <laughs> the, the one thing, the one thing that I that I would probably like to to mention, just because uh, it's kind of, um, I spoke earlier about compasses, uh, about mm-hmm. um, the the and probably. I've had I've had wonderful instructors through my paragliding and teachers through all my stuff, but um, the, probably the biggest teacher that I've I've had is has been my um, I've got a I'm blessed to have a son, um, Taylor, mm. uh, who's just mm. been probably the biggest the, probably the biggest blessing to me. You know, um, uh, sure. his mom and I got divorced a number of years ago. We still get on very well, but uh, he mm. started skydiving. He's always been passionate about my lifestyle. He started, mm-hmm. he started uh, not skydiving, he started paragliding uh, when mm-hmm. he was about eight years old, running up the hills with my little speed wings, did a paragliding awesome. course, but his, his driving force was always to become a pilot. Um, yeah. And he's now, he now flies a Cessna caravan for a company in Joburg for Fed Air. Um, he's flying into the bush and all the reserves. But uh, yeah, he's, uh, if everything, everything that I've done and that I've achieved, my proudest achievement has been seeing this young kid grow up you know, to, to who he is now and what he's doing. Um, and if that's the legacy that I leave, then um, I've, I'm happy. I've had an amazing life. And yeah, that's been, that's been great. I, 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 I feel, I feel you. I mean, that is, yeah. that is, that is, that is what it's about. It's, um, um, yeah. you know, um, I agree hundred um, percent. I have three daughters and it's the same thing. What we leave behind is, 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 is not just that we leave our children behind, but we leave our children behind with um, our words that echo in their heads and our actions yeah. that are examples for them, and uh, and kudos to you for um, uh, for 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 having um, um, that legacy to to pass on. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for for being on the podcast. Um, I really appreciate it for taking the time out of your day. And um, my pleasure, and John. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and right. I would like to still look forward to hopefully one day coming to visit you in your neck of the woods. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Nice okay, chatting, John. Uh, nice chatting. Cheers. Okay, and and we're off. Okay. Um. Um. Thank you, Jeff. That was that was fantastic. My pleasure, man. Uh,